Island Crimes and Mysteries with Newells. Hey guys and welcome to another episode of Ireland Crimes and Mysteries. I want to thank you for joining me today and if you're a returning listener I want to say a big thank you for your continued support. If this is your first time listening to my podcast, welcome. It's great to have you on board. So without further ado, let's get started on today's story. I just want to advise you before we start today's episode that the content could be distressing to some people. Nestled on the rugged northwest coast of Ireland, County Donegal is a place of breathtaking beauty and enchanting landscapes. With its dramatic cliffs, pristine beaches and rolling hills, this county is a haven for nature lovers and adventure seekers alike. The picturesque villages and towns will have you enthralled by their charm and the warmth of the locals will keep bringing you back. The quaint traditional thatched cottages and the sound of traditional Irish music floating through the air creates an atmosphere that is truly magical. Ballyshannon, County Donegal is a town located in the southern part of the county on the banks of the River Erne. It's a 10-minute drive from Bundoran and 20 minutes from Donegal Town and Mullochmore, County Sligo. It is known as one of Ireland's oldest towns with archaeological remains dating back to the Neolithic period. Ballyshannon is a quieter alternative if you're looking to stay somewhere with less of the hustle and bustle of Donegal Town, but still have easy access to all the tourist attractions and beautiful scenery County Donegal is famous for. Our story today takes us to Cashelard, a small townsland approximately five miles outside the town of Ballyshannon. This was the location of a remote farm that was the family home of a lady called Anne Boyle. Anne is the mother of the little girl our story centres around, and her name is Mary Boyle. Mary Boyle was six years old at the time of her disappearance on the 18th of March 1977. She is known as Ireland's youngest and longest missing person, while others refer to her case as Ireland's Madeleine McCann. The only difference being for Mary's family, especially her sister Anne, it never received the same media coverage as Madeleine's and has largely been consigned to history, allegedly by the powers that be. Which, if true, is a travesty really. On Thursday, March the 17th, 1977, Mary, along with her parents Anne and Patrick, her identical twin sister Anne and their brother Patrick, made the two-hour trip from Kincasla to Cashelard to her grandparents' farm. The family were coming down to attend the anniversary mass of a deceased relative and decided to stay for a few days. After helping her mother with the washing up, Anne's mother assumed Mary had joined her siblings and cousins who were outside in the yard playing. But what she didn't realise was that Mary followed her uncle Jerry, who was returning a ladder to his neighbour, who lived on another farm just across the hillside. According to Jerry, Mary started following him across the boggy fields, but decided to return about halfway through their journey, telling her uncle she was going home. A journey that should have only taken her five minutes. On arrival at the neighbour's house, her uncle stayed on chatting for around 30 minutes, not realising his niece had never made it home. Mary Boyle and her identical twin sister Anne were born in Birmingham, England in 1970. Her parents had emigrated from Donegal some years earlier to Birmingham, where they met each other and married in 1967. Her mother hailed from Cashelard and her father from Oe Island, just off the coast of Donegal. Her father worked in a factory there, while her mother worked as a bus conductor. Their son Patrick was born in 1968, with Mary and Anne arriving two years after. Then in 1972, Charlie and Anne decided to move back home to Donegal to be nearer their family, where they originally moved to Charlie's home of Oe Island, before eventually settling on the mainland around Kincasla. Anne and Mary had a very strong bond and were very rarely seen without each other. Anne describing Mary as bubbly and feisty, stating that Mary did the talking for the both of them. She said no one would walk on Mary, saying that she would stand up to anyone. 
She said in their six years together, they had probably just had about two rows. They were very close. She said they never wanted to do anything on their own. They just wanted to be together. They had travelled down from Kincastle the day prior to her disappearance to the home of her grandparents, the Gallaghers, to attend the anniversary mass of an uncle of Mary's who had died in a tractor accident some years prior. The family wouldn't visit that often and there was even a doubt they would make it this time as Anne had been sick in the run-up to the trip. But having rallied enough to make the journey, they got up early that morning and headed down. They attended Mass that evening and after that they headed back to their grandparents' house and had dinner. The family then headed into the fair that was on in Belik. They stayed that night in the farmhouse with their grandparents and their uncle and his family. The following day Mary got up and dressed, putting the clothes that she would be wearing when she went missing on. A lilac jumper and brown trousers with a white and purple ribbon in her hair to tie it back. She put on a pair of Wellingtons that were actually a size too big for her. The tiny farmhouse cottage was bustling with activity, having accommodated 11 people the previous night. The five Boyles, Mary's grandparents and her uncle Jerry and his wife, as well as their two children. That day, after they all had had their dinner, Anne asked Mary to go outside and play. But Mary didn't want to go. She wanted to help clean up after the dinner. This turned out to be the last interaction the identical twins had with each other. Having allegedly followed her uncle who was returning the ladder to the neighbours after fixing a tile on the roof that was causing a leak. Jerry was a member of the local Fianna Fáil party and worked as a charge hand with the Office of Public Works where his job was the maintenance of local rivers. The journey to the neighbour's house was no longer than 800 metres through the fields, which were surrounded by three to four foot stone walls. He said Mary jumped over the walls with ease, without his help, as they made their way to the neighbours. He stated that as they were walking, they happened upon a particularly muddy patch, an area that was flooded. And this was when Mary made the decision to head home. Jerry said when he looked back, Mary was heading back in the direction they had come. He said he continued on his journey and was gone for approximately 30 minutes. Neither Mary nor Jerry had let anyone know that Mary was going with her uncle to the neighbours and after a while her mother became concerned when she could not find Mary. After searching for Mary, her mother decided to ring the Gardaí and one of the first Garda on the scene was Sergeant Martin Collins from Ballyshannon Garda Station. When he arrived at the farmhouse in Cashelard, he spoke initially with Mary's uncle who explained to Sergeant Collins what had allegedly happened in the lead-up to her disappearance. Jerry then allegedly advised Sergeant Collins not to speak with Mary's parents as they were in the house and too upset to talk to anyone. Which was an odd statement to make. One would assume, despite their distress, they would do anything to find their child. ASAP. In the coming days, various witness statements were taken and Gardy soon realised that Things just didn't seem to be adding up. Mary's mother Anne stated that she first noticed her daughter was missing at around 4.20 that afternoon. She had shouted out to the children who were playing out in the front if they had seen her. She said her brother Jerry was out in the yard at the time leaning against a wall but did not mention that Mary had followed him when she shouted out in a panic. He just started walking in the direction of the neighbour's house he had dropped the ladder off to. She mentioned this several times when giving her statement to Gardy, saying, When I looked out and saw only four children, Jerry was there at the wall. He didn't mention to me at any time that Mary was missing and didn't tell me that she was with him until the first search was carried out. Sergeant Collins also raised his concern about the amount of time that had passed before Gardy were contacted. Mary went missing according to her mother after 4pm, but the Gardaí were not contacted until after 6.30pm. Anne had walked to a local lake called Loch Column Kill where she spoke with some fishermen and asked them if they had seen Mary. They said they did not see her and advised her to contact the Gardaí. Jerry was at the opposite side of the lake and she shouted out to him to go back and call the Gardaí, but he shouted back and told her to do it. After some toing and froing, the fishermen finally called the Gardaí. 
The loss of two and a half hours was a big setback to the Gardaí, as every minute counts when a child goes missing. Another factor that did not sit well with the Gardaí was the fact that Jerry said he had taken Charlie, Mary's father's car, a red Fort Cortina, out looking for Mary around the lake, later driving it back to the farmhouse. But this was disputed by Anne Boyle, who said that he had left the car abandoned on the road and that she had driven it back from the lake, stopping at the neighbours en route to ask if they had seen Mary. Sergeant Collins was concerned about several aspects of Jerry's statement, which in his eyes just didn't add up. He found it hard to believe that Mary could easily climb stone walls three to four feet high without any help. She was only six years old after all. These single stone walls would be too high for her to navigate and adding to the difficulty of climbing these walls was the fact that the top stones were loose, so grabbing hold of them would be near impossible for a girl of Mary's age. And if she had made this journey, she would have had three walls to climb. Jerry had stated he never helped Mary to climb over these walls. Several theories were bandied about over the years as to what happened to Mary. One theory being she was abducted by a stranger. With several known sex offenders being investigated, one man was arrested in 2014 for questioning about the kidnapping, but would later be released without charge. Her mother Anne had put forward several of her own theories about what she thought had happened to Mary. She suggested that she initially thought she had just went astray on the mountain and got lost on her way home, but she soon began to think she was abducted. In later years, she suggested that Mary had gone missing of her own accord, walking to the town of Belik some seven kilometres from the house over the border into Northern Ireland. Anne claimed that they had visited the town the day before and Mary had seen toys there that she wanted and her theory was that she made the journey back to see these toys again. All these theories have been dismissed by the Gardaí as there is no evidence to back up the idea she was abducted or left of her own free will. Another fact that dismisses the theory that she went over the border was the fact that this was smack bang in the middle of the Troubles and border security was extremely high at the time. So a six-year-old girl would be noticed. There was checkpoints everywhere where people could cross. Also, it was a very remote area that Mary went missing from. There were not that many cars. Gardy were able to eliminate all cars in the area as having had anything to do with any potential abduction. About a week after Mary disappeared, Sergeant Collins was leaving the Garda station in Ballyshannon when he was contacted by a man. This man allegedly knew Mary. He later met with this man who got into his car and began to cry, saying what an awful thing it was that had happened, stating he had children of the same age. Sergeant Collins put three scenarios to him as to what he thought had happened to her. One being that she was still out there in the wilderness missing. The second being that she had been kidnapped and finally that she had been murdered. He asked him which one he thought had happened to Mary and he replied, the last one. This man was a relative of Mary Boyle's but has not been named. He was re-interviewed by another sergeant a few days later. He asked the man to tell him where she was when he started crying again saying that they were accusing him of murdering Mary. At which point he eased off the questioning after being instructed to do so by another guard at present. But to this day he feels if he had been allowed to press him, he would have got the answers they were seeking. He said he knew by his demeanour that he had a guilty look about him. During this period a call was made to the guard station in Ballyshannon by a politician. He said in the course of the conversation that none of a particular family should be made out to be suspects in Mary's disappearance. As a result of this call, Gardy were told to basically stop looking at this man as a suspect and look in another direction. In April 2016, MEP Lynn Boylan spoke at the European Parliament and put these allegations on the record. This is Mary Boyle. Ireland's longest missing child case. Six-year-old Mary disappeared in 1977 
and the man whom her twin sister believes is responsible for her disappearance still lives in that community and has never been formally brought in for questioning. Allegedly, a still-sitting politician directly intervened and that intervention led to one of the worst cases of police cover-up we have seen in Ireland. Almost one year ago, I brought Mary's twin sister Anne to this Parliament seeking justice. Article 2 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights guarantees the right to life. Six-year-old Mary was denied that right. Article 20 of the Charter guarantees the right to equality before the law. Mary was denied that right. To this day, there has been no inquest into Mary's death, no commission of investigation despite a formal request from the legal team. In fact, it has never even been debated in the Irish Parliament, which is why I am forced to raise it here tonight. Six-year-old Mary Boyle has been failed by the Irish state. After Lynn Boylan addressed the European Parliament, there was hope it would be addressed in the Doyle. But astonishingly, the deafening silence was very noticeable as this address went on deaf ear. What was also noted was the fact that the mainstream media were ignoring the case as well. This silence was noted in an English newspaper, The Guardian, whose headline read, Why has Ireland's mainstream media turned its back on Mary Boyle? A lot of rumours as to why this politician's words had such an effect on the investigation were bandied about. One such rumour was the blackmail of officers by those higher up in the organisation. The local superintendent in Ballyshannon at the time was subject to some controversy as he had given several conflicting accounts of the case. He stated in a 2000 interview with RTE that Jerry had told Mary to go home through the fields, which conflicts with Jerry's accounts of what had transpired as he said in his statement that he had no idea why she turned back, assuming it was the muck, and he certainly did not tell her to go back, saying she left of her own free will. The superintendent also said that Jerry and Mary had come upon a two-foot pool of water, prompting Mary to turn back and head home, when the fact was this pool was only about six inches deep. A 1985 documentary stated that a 17-page letter of complaint from another Garda, who is now deceased, was written to the Garda management about this superintendent. It mentioned words like untouchables and mentioned an old pal's pact. It voices serious concerns by some Garda about how the investigation had played out. The letter mentioned the close relationship that the superintendent had with members of the Fianna Fáil party. It even alleged that this superintendent had gone to a Fianna Fáil convention in 1979. Gardaí are not meant to openly show political allegiance under Garda regulations. Fifteen years after Mary's disappearance, Sergeant Collins was coming up to his retirement and was anxious to talk to the suspect before he retired. He spoke with him at Ballyshannon Garda station. I told him that my belief was that this person had murdered Mary. Uh, I was expecting a verbal or physical reaction to my question. It didn't materialise. Uh, again, began to rehash the whole thing about Mary's disappearance from the time she was went missing from the time she was last seen and uh, this person uh, said nothing. Island Crimes and Mysteries After their conversation he left the station leaving Sergeant Collins convinced that this was their man but there was no further investigation into him and he was never arrested in relation to Mary's disappearance only ever questioned as a witness. Another person close to Mary had also identified who they believed killed Mary, but has never been questioned officially. This was not Mary's sister, but was someone known to them both. It appeared to be an open secret amongst people who knew Mary well what had happened to her and who had done it, with a lot of conversations being had through the years about this suspected killer who had been protected by the highest ranks of society. 
But what was the motivation to murder a six-year-old little girl? Mary's sister Anne believes, as she said, quote, Mary had a secret, and because Mary was feisty, Mary would have told. So I believe Mary had to be killed to stop her from telling. And when asked what she thought this secret was, she replied that she believed Mary had been sexually assaulted. Sergeant Collins also believes that this scenario is probably the real reason Mary had to die, along with other investigating officers that were basically allegedly silenced from pursuing this person. They remained distraught that they were unable to bring him to justice and he continued to walk free under the protection of certain high-ranking people. Over the years, Mary's sister Anne has pleaded with the Gardaí to act on their suspicion, but to no avail. Gardaí maintained the very fact that he was allowed to be free after allegedly doing what he did to Mary, he was a danger to other people as well. Sergeant Collins said he expressed his concerns along with other Gardaí over the years to those higher up in the Garda Síochána, but this went on deaf ears. Anne has continued to campaign for answers and justice for her twin sister Mary and has been backed by Irish country singer Margot O'Donnell, who is a distant relative of the twins. She is under the same assumption as Anne, that Mary had to be silenced because she had been assaulted and was going to tell. Margot has over the years commissioned many searches of the area and championed for justice for Mary. In 2011, she decided to commission another search and contacted Anne, who was so thankful for her help and immediately came to help coordinate the search. Margot contacted the Gardaí in Ballyshannon to ask for ordnance survey maps of the area in question that could help with the search. Initially, she was told no problem by the Gardaí at the other end of the phone. But it was never followed up by the Gardaí despite Margot's continued calls to the station for maps. On her last call to the station, she spoke with a Garda who seemed shocked at her request and told her that the case was basically closed as it was far too long in the past and there was nothing there now regarding the case. Then in 2014, Anne was visited at her home in County Offaly by two Garda without any notice, one of which was from County Donegal in what Anne described herself as an intimidating visit. The nature of their call, according to Anne, was to veer her away from the person she knew as being the chief suspect and plant another name in her head. It was at this time the man I had referred to earlier was arrested and questioned at Mullingar Station by Gardaí. His name was Brian McMahon and he was 64 years of age at the time of his arrest. Friends and family of Brian were very upset that he was arrested as were the people fighting for justice for Mary. Brian was described by many as being very popular in his community and this arrest just did not add up and everyone who knew him were steadfast in their belief that he had no act nor part in Mary Boyle's disappearance. His arrest appeared to coincide with the increased attention Anne and Margot were trying to bring to the case. A bit of a coincidence, you would think, after 37 years of nothingness. At the time of Mary's disappearance, Brian was stationed at Finner Army Camp, which was just outside Ballyshannon. Brian had a very troubled and tumultuous upbringing after his mother abandoned him as a child. He spent a good chunk of his childhood in state institutions and foster families, where again he was subject to horrendous treatment, for which he received compensation from the State Redress Board. He had been convicted in 2013 of indecent assault, these offences allegedly taking place as far back as his teenage years, and was serving his sentence in the Midlands Prison Port Leash when he was arrested and questioned about Mary Boyle's case. Brian McMahon vehemently denies all allegations made against him in the Mary Boyle case. As I stated, Brian had been stationed as an army officer in the army camp approximately 11 kilometres from where Mary disappeared. Brian states he was at the army camp the day she went missing and would have had no mode of transport to travel the 11 kilometres. Furthermore, he did not know Mary. During questioning, Gardy insinuated that Brian could have walked to the area and abducted Mary, all while on foot. 
He said during an interview that Gardy said to him that he arrived in the area and lo and behold, there in front of you was your prize catch. A statement he described as despicable. He said Gardy allegedly used lots of intimidation tactics to garner a confession from him, including high-speed journeys in patrol cars with sirens blazing, as well as a trip on his second evening for what he described as an opportunity for the papers to get their picture on the front pages. He stated he knew 100% that the Gardaí who were interviewing him knew he wasn't the man. A file was sent to the DPP, who on reviewing them made the decision that there was not enough evidence to bring official charges against Brian for Mary Boyle's abduction. Sergeant Collins was shocked by the arrest of Brian McMahon, stating that his name never came up in their investigation, describing his possible involvement in Mary's case as impossible. Another name thrown into the mix by Gardy and some crime reporters was that of Robert Black, a known Scottish sex offender. It had been stated that Robert Black was allegedly in Ireland in 1977 and possibly in the north, approximately four miles from the border on the actual date she disappeared. Black died in 2016 and no concrete evidence linking him to her abduction has ever been found. Campaigners for justice for Mary, as well as certain family members, don't believe Robert Black had anything to do with her disappearance and probable murder. Sergeant Collins also believes Robert Black had no part in Mary's disappearance, stating, There is no evidence whatsoever that he was in the area. He went on to say, It would be a chance in a million that he would be in the Cashelard area at the time Mary went missing, which was a time period of approximately 40 minutes in a very isolated part of the countryside. To be in the area where Mary was last seen, an impossibility. He finished off by saying he cringes when he hears his name being linked to the case because he knows it is such a remote possibility that he was there. Sergeant Collins also dismisses the possibility that Mary could have fell into a slurry pit, a swamp or lake, saying every inch of lakes and surrounding areas was thoroughly searched by professional sub-aqua teams. In 2015, Margot and Anne started a new appeal in their campaign for justice. Up to now, Gardy would only work with Anne Boyle, Mary's mother, as she was the next of kin. So Margot and Anne campaigned to have the case relinquished by Ballyshannon Garda Station and instead taken on by Pier Street Station in Dublin. They went to Pier Street and made a statement there, hoping that the chief suspect would be re-arrested and questioned. But he was never arrested, and to their absolute horror and dismay, after being promised by the interviewing Garda that it would not be ignored or just put in a drawer, nothing came out of it with Margot saying she believes it was put deeper into a drawer than ever before. Margot said at the time she knows a lot of people would love her to just go away, which does make her feel that she is in a dangerous position. Mary Boyle's case has yet again gone quiet over the last few years, and one would wonder if it will ever be solved. Her father Charlie died in a fishing accident in 2005, having never gotten over the disappearance of his beloved daughter. Mary's sister Anne feels her dad did know what happened to Mary, but was unable to say anything. Despite the quietness in the media about Mary's case recently, her sister Anne is still actively campaigning in the background for her identical twin. She has visited Stormont, the seat of government in Northern Ireland, with other bereaved families, who suggests police corruption in their cases too, to highlight the case. She has travelled extensively with this group, highlighting the case in such places as Washington and Brussels. Margot O'Donnell stated that in 2011 she contacted the then Taoiseach Enda Kenny regarding the case, as he had close links to County Donegal, hoping his position as leader of the country could help with moving the case forward. But Margot says he again did nothing. Mary Lou MacDonald, in front of a doll sitting, publicly asked the Taoiseach in 2015 would he be willing to meet with Anne, Mary's sister, and questioned him on allegations of political interference and subsequent alleged Garda cover-up. 
He said he had referred the allegations he was aware of back to the Gardaí and was unsure if they were followed up. He did agree to meet her. This was the first time since 1977 that Mary's case had been raised in the Doyle. Mary Lou raised the issue again in 2016 after he had met with Anne, where he said he'd had a very good meeting with her and had sent an official report to the Gardaí. He understood that the Special Investigative Unit was taking a look at it with fresh eyes. This again ultimately led nowhere. In December 2015, Anne's legal team requested a new search to be carried out, as she was convinced her sister's remains are still in the area she disappeared. This request was denied. But in 2016 it was granted. But the search has never taken place to this day. Anne now lives with her husband and family in Offaly. She has no contact with her mother Anne. She maintains her mother has tried to hamper her quest for justice. Her mother has denied this and has threatened legal action on Anne in the past. Anne met the Donegal coroner in 2015 to request he open an inquest in an attempt to get to the truth. But her mother has come out saying that she does not want an inquest. Even going as far as saying she will put it in her will that she does not back any inquest that would be held after her death. This statement totally contradicts previous statements she had made on several programmes over the years, saying she wishes to know what happened to her daughter before she dies. What has happened or who has been speaking to Mary's mother to make her do such an inexplicable U-turn? The coroner has also denied any requests by Mary's sister to open an inquest, saying to her legal team it would adversely affect Mary's mother's health. All the cover-ups over the years seem to have stemmed from that original phone call to the Garda station in Ballyshannon by a Fianna Fáil politician to divert attention away from the prime suspect who was known to the family in the early days of the investigation. This has over the years caused a massive divide within the family and pitched mother against daughter, which is very misfortunate. Mary's sister seems determined to want to get to the truth and while this seemed to be the same for Mary's mother initially, her thought process appears to have changed. The question is, why? She is at odds with her daughter and how she has actively pursued the answers. Her reactions don't make sense. The Justice for Mary Facebook page, which is run by relatives of Mary's on her father's side, who have backed all Mary and Margot's fights for justice, was started in 2016 and is a great way to keep up to date on where the case is at. It has been said that the prime suspect in the case allegedly was acting strange the night where Mary went missing and left their house for several hours in their car. It is unknown where this person went. Their house or car has never been searched. This suspect, when asked directly by a Garda had he murdered Mary, did not confirm nor deny it. The level of alleged corruption in this case, if true, is off the charts. And I feel so sorry for Mary's sister Anne. In conclusion, Mary Boyle's 1977 disappearance remains an unsolved mystery made more so by the claims of political meddling and corruption within the Guard of Force, which, if true, have further clouded the inquiry and brought so much more unnecessary distress to her sister Anne. Even after all these years, Mary's disappearance serves as a sobering reminder of the difficulties in handling missing person investigations. Especially when there are doubts about outside interference, claims of Garda corruption and purported political meddling having complicated an already confusing story, igniting debates about the necessity of accountability and openness in these kinds of investigations. We need to acknowledge the significant impact Mary's disappearance had on her family, the community and Ireland's collective consciousness as her family struggled to uncover the elusive truth surrounding it. In addition to an uncompromising commitment to piecing together the facts, the quest for justice for Mary Boyle necessitates tackling the structural issues that have impeded the investigation. Mary's narrative will serve as a reminder of the value of unwavering endurance in the face of purported political meddling and guarded corruption until the day comes when the truth is hopefully uncovered. 
Well, it's the very least that Mary deserves is justice. It's the very, very least. And like everyone else, she deserves a proper investigation. She deserves a decent burial. It's her human right and it should be given to her. If you have any information on the disappearance of Mary Boyle, please contact the incident room at Ballyshannon Garda Station on 071-985-8530 or the Garda Confidential Line on 1-800-666-111 or alternatively, you can just contact your local Garda station with the information. So guys, that's it for today's episode of the Ireland Crimes and Mysteries podcast. Again, thanks for your listenership and don't forget to subscribe to the show and hit that auto download so you never miss an episode. Until the next time, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. This podcast has been compiled from information gathered in the public sphere, like news articles, documentaries and open source material that can be found on the web. Everything in this podcast is alleged unless a conviction has taken place. You've been listening to Island Crimes and Mysteries with Nils. Join us for another episode coming real soon.